This is Greg from the Bass College. I'm down here at Bass Pro Shops in Orlando, Florida with professional angler Shaw Grigsby. We're having a good time down here. We're down here and we're just going to be talking fishing. So we got Bobby Lane that's up here talking. And you know, the spring fishing fair is really cool because when it's going on, it's all about fishing. So you can come down and learn all, everything from saltwater fishing, freshwater fishing, you got all kinds of pros. And we're just having a good time, man. And the best thing about it is we're here in Florida where it's sunny and warm and getting warmer this week. And we've had some cold weather. So, and cold weather for us is really for me anything under 50 and I'm cold. <laughs> Trust me, being born and raised, natural Floridian, anything under 50, I'm bundled up. So. When is your next tournament? Next tournament's uh, the Elite Tournament in Orange, Texas. So we're going to have a good time there, and hopefully it'll be warm there also. You know, and he knows, because he fishes there all the time with the Kissimmee chain. So you have buddies that you can call and ask and, and really get a handle on what's going on. Well, Major League Fishing, you got none of it. You got none of it. You got 15 minutes. They don't even tell you the lake you're going. They won't hand you the map until you're backing down the ramp. They hand you a map and you go, cool, that's where I'm going, right? And then you look at it and, and all it is is a rough map. And then you got to turn on your GPS. You turn on your Lorenz and you look. And now you're looking at contours and whatever you can get. And, uh, and then you make decisions. You know, this is the time of year. This is what I should be doing. This is how I should be able to catch them. And you do that all. You launch the boat, take off. They give you 15 minutes to look over the area you're going to fish. And then you're, you're in competition so right off the bat. And to me, it's the most intense fishing you'll ever do because not only are you having to figure everything out yourself right then and there, you know, every second, but there's no limit. So it's not like I catch five and I can go, Phew. I caught five, maybe I can upgrade, right? It's every single fish counts, every one of them. So, because you're letting them go. So they're weighing them, letting them go. So there's no, no backing off. You can't ever relax and, uh, because somebody will just, you know, clean your clock. And I don't know how many guys saw the sudden death round two that I was in and I got plowed over. But Kevin Van Dam, here he is like catching him. He's in the lead and then all of a sudden he's in second and he sits around there and then he's around third, second, third, third, and then, all of a sudden at the end he's down to fourth and he doesn't make it. He doesn't make the cut in a smallmouth fishery. So you can see you can get beat, anybody can, because it's how efficient you are, how you figure them out, just right then, dial in and just, just catch them. And so it's an amazingly intense deal and it's the most exciting fishing that I ever have done. And, and uh, it was pretty cool on my first round and I didn't know this. So I'm out there fishing, right, and I don't know what's going on. They put it in a TV show at the end, and then that's when you really see what's going on. So I'm out here fishing, and all of a sudden I jump into the lead on round one, you know, and I'm like, here we go. Come on. I'm in the lead, right? And I'm figuring I really got this figured out. I got some drop shot fish where I can watch them on the graph and catch them, and I caught a couple on top water. And actually, I, I brought in uh, close to a two pounder, and I landed him because you belly land a, a smallmouth. They just quit. You know, you lay them in your, in your, in your hand and cradle them across here, you quit, and then you lip them. Well, I bellied him, I turned to the camera, and I went to lip him, and he goes and jumps overboard and leaves me with the plug. So he's gone. I had him inside the boat, and he jumps overboard. I'm glad I didn't get a two-minute penalty for that, because you know, I released him above the gun. But I didn't get a penalty. I probably should have. I hadn't thought about that. I'll have to ask him on that one next time. But anyway, so he launched himself over. I lost him. And I couldn't believe it. Well, I stand up, catch another one, and then, and then I get in the lead. And next thing I know, here comes Iconelli. Comes racing up, poof, shuts down right below me and starts fishing up, fishing up. And of course, I'm telling the camera guy, I'm going, yeah, I guess, I guess this is a community hole. And I, pr I probably ought to tell him he's not part of the community because <laughs> he and Kevin Van Dam and Ike got in a big one at Kentucky, uh, not at Kentucky Lake, at the Chickamauga last year. And Van Dam had been fishing this one point the whole tournament long. And on the final day, day four, so he's been there three days, day four, here comes Iconelli, hadn't been there one time, pulls right up on Kevin, and Kevin's like, what are you doing? And Ike says, I'm fishing. He says, dude, you haven't been here, this isn't your spot. And Ike goes, what's well, community hole? And he goes, yeah, but you're not part of the community. <laughs> and it was a great, great deal. They showed that all on television. I was laughing. So anyway, here, here comes Ike, he's coming up to me. And I'm just dying laughing because of the whole deal, and uh, that he's right here, and uh, and he fishes around and fishing around. Well, in the TV show, you see what happened. He's he's down, 
he sees I'm catching, I've caught like five at this point, and it's pretty early in the morning that I've caught five fish, and he's going, we gotta go find Grigsby. We gotta see what he's doing. We gotta know what he's doing. And so he runs up and fishes around me for a few minutes, and I gotta hold him off, casting at him and stuff. So he fishes around me just so he can see what I'm doing, right? And um, I thought that was pretty, you know, when it happened, I wasn't happy he was there, obviously. But it wasn't a big deal, but that's what happens, you know. But when I saw it on TV show, I said, you know, that's pretty cool, man. Well, I had to look up the old guy, you know. And try, and so I felt kind of a little honored about it after that. Somebody asked me that on Facebook. I said, yeah, you know, when it first happened, I wasn't happy. But anyway, but it's a fun, fun show. If you, if you haven't seen it, it's on the Outdoor Channel. And it's every uh, Saturday, 2 to 4. It's a two-hour show. You'd think it's a 15-minute show. Uh, when you sit down and watch it, it goes so fast because it's competition, it's fish after fish after fish. And uh, they just experimented with that this year. They've been doing one hour shows, but there was so much more in it and so much more, you know, competition. It's like you sit down and watch a NASCAR race, it's at least three hours and, um, and can stretch a little longer. Well, this is just two hours, it goes by super fast. And, uh, and the competition's over and then it continues the next week. So uh, we, we've had every round tomorrow, Saturday, 2 to 4, uh, when I'll be here. In fact, I do a seminar at 2. Maybe I can get them to turn on that outdoor channel here at Bass Pro Shops. But anyway, because Bass Pro Shop sponsors it, uh, uh, Nitro sponsors it, and that's kind of a neat deal. Um, but anyway, um, they'll have the lessons, major league lessons. So that's how the guys won each of the days that they're out there. And that's kind of a fun thing because then you get in-depth on how they're doing it. But what's really cool about Major League is you get to see the guy hit the water and try to figure it out. That's what we do every day we go fishing. You go out tomorrow, you want to go fishing, it's going to be a beautiful day. You want to go fishing, what are you going to do? You're going to get out there and try to figure them out. Now, if you have your favorite spots out there where you say, man, I caught them here last time and I caught them here last year, you'll go to those spots and they may or may not be any good. But what we do as professional anglers is we're not really looking at spots. We go and develop a pattern and figure out what are these fish doing out there right now? You know, what are they doing? And so the first thing you have to have is just an idea of what they do. Like right now in Florida, if I was going fishing tomorrow, the first thing I'd do is I'd go, all right, I want to find some warm water, and maybe canals, depending on where I'm at. You know, if it's Toho, it's probably fairly warm anyway, so I'll just go towards the bank and I'll be looking for little pockets, little cuts, little canals, little ditches, things where those fish can get there and spawn. And I'd prefer something that may be north, northeast, bank, because you know your, your trending winds are, are north, northeast, northwest. Those are always you know, the winds that are coming, so anything on the north bank, plus the sun is basically in the south, and it rises in the east, and it sets in the west, and the hottest uh, time of the day is in the afternoon. So that's going to be the north uh, east side of the lake gets that sun pounding on it. So that's going to be the first part that warms up. Okay, so if I'm looking for lakes that warm up, I'm going to look for something protected kind of on that side. So Toho, that would be Goblet's Cove, you know, that's kind of north end. If you're in Kissimmee, it's all around the school bus, right? If you're in, in uh, Cyprus, it's at North Cove up there in Cyprus, it's always good. So you have places like that, you know, it's going to warm up a little bit more because the wind isn't going to stir it up. It's all blowing down towards the south end and, and doing that. So that's kind of the places that I would go look at, right? And I'd go, these fish should be getting there spawning, so I'm going to go shallow. I'm going to get up there in that skinny stuff. I might look for them, right? I may just throw a worm. And one thing I did at Toho, we had the Southern Open, and I just grabbed all this stuff out of my boat and truck and everything. And, and uh, so this is, this is the stuff I fish. The rods I just pulled straight out of the top of my rod box. So this, I didn't have to dig for them because these are the stuff that I use. This was, you know, one thing, this, and you've heard Bobby talk about it, lipless crankbait. Now I put a little cover on this because I didn't want everybody to get hooked up. Also, because it's got those trocar trebles, but this is just a red eye shad. And a lipless bait is phenomenal in the grass. In fact, with this bait, I did a show in, uh, on Toho uh, a number of years back, and we mashed them. When I say mashed them, I caught them up to almost 10 pounds on this thing. But every day, we catch probably two or three biggins you know, all around noon to one o'clock in the afternoon. Never happened in the morning, 
But you got getting it warm, and all of a sudden, wham, 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 you can catch them sixes, sevens, eights, nines. It was just a blast. And you can see those hooks are way too sharp. Anyway, so you got to have a lipless crankbait on, really good, ripping it out of the grass. Make sure it hits the grass, sticks in the grass, and then you rip it out. So when you do that, there's two things you can do that help you rip it out, okay? Number one is a stiff rod. Number two is right here, is braided line, okay? So don't hesitate to throw braided line on a lipless bait in the grass or any crankbait in the grass because what happens with braid? First off, it doesn't stretch, so you can rip it and it's direct contact and it'll break free of the hydrilla, it'll break free of the grass. So it's real simple to do that and you get a lot of the grass. It is a lot of work. So I highly recommend putting some braid on your reel because when I rip it, and I'll just show you, it's not like this, right? It's like you're ripping it. And I mean, you're hitting it so hard, it's like you're doing a major hook set every time it's in the grass. You rip it out and it breaks free from the hydrilla and whoo, they just crush it. So you're like ripping it, boom, your rod will just jerk down and you just hang on. And uh, so it's really, really fun, but it can work you if you use fluorocarbon. Now we know fluorocarbon disappears. This is, in fact, on this one is a Brazex. I love a Brazex, but Invisex is good, and they're all Seaguar. Seaguar invented the stuff. Most people don't even know that, but they're the ones that invented and brought fluorocarbon. Everybody else just kind of copied it and trying to figure it out. These guys are the best. That's why they don't make one, and everybody makes one. They make you know, the red label, they make Invisex, they make a Brazex, they make Tatsu, they make, you know, so many different fluorocarbons that are for different specific things so that you have the right line for every application. But one thing about 100% fluorocarbon, it basically disappears in water. Same refractive index disappears, so you get more bites. So if you see almost every one of my rods that I carry will have fluorocarbon. You know, my lipless bait here, this is one of the fun things to fish in Florida, just a swim jig. Okay, uh, both of those are real good and what the bait I was talking about that I would throw right now that I caught a bunch of them on is this one right here. And I'll just pass this pack, I'll take one out and uh, so you can see it. Now the first thing you know when you look at this thing you go, well it kind of looks like a Cinco, Ocho, all those O baits. I'm going to take this off, donate it. <laughs> so, and Y'all can see the packaging. That's mine and the bait. And this is the one I'm using. There you go. All right. So it's called a cut R. And it's one of the neatest little baits because you know how good those little stick baits are. The, the Ochos are tremendous, which I actually have a pack of Ochos here. And actually, you can send them side by side and see the difference. This is, and you can see this, you know, it's really got that KBD super plastic. You can see how spongy and all. And so just kind of hand them back and forth. And you can see that's an Ocho, but look at the cut R. The cut R is basically an Ocho or Cinco, but it has a tail on it that's the Rage tail. And the Rage tail is one of those things just got so much action you can't believe it. So it's got one little tail, so it's doing this all the time. So what do I do with that at the Southern Open? I just throw it out there on a small weight with a, like a 5 aught TK120. Uh, the 120 is, is just one of the all outstanding hooks. And I would pass it around, but it's right here. It's just your wide gap. Let's see if you can see it, if I hold it right there. 90 degree bend, you know, wide gap, typical wide gap hook. Um, but with this, if and I could pass it around, I just don't want anybody to get hooked because they're pretty doggone sharp, man. I mean, when you talk about that, I'll let y'all do it. Just don't get hooked. And uh, very, very sharp. And you can buy all this stuff right here. Bass Pro Shops has everything you want to go catch a fish. They've got it. And to go hunting, which is one of my passions and everything else. So, But anyway, so I just take that with a small tungsten weight. And why do I use tungsten? First off, because it's tiny, right? It's about uh, a third smaller than lead. Okay, so a lot of us have lead weights. Tungsten's expensive, right? Um, but the thing about tungsten is smaller and it's harder. It's extremely hard. In fact, they use tungsten on the end of offshore drilling bits to drill into the ground, okay? So it's basically about as hard as diamond, right? So now you have something that 
they can't grip because it's so hard. It's dense, it's hard, they can't grip it because it's so hard, like lead's really soft, they can get teeth in it. You'll see teeth marks in lead and they'll shred it. Well, fish can get a hold of it, get in your mouth, you set the hook, you'll turn a fish around, he'll open his mouth, boom, pops out, and you don't have it, right? Well, tungsten, they can't do that because it's like, it'd be like you holding on to a little piece of glass and somebody trying to pull it. It's going to slide out of your hand. There's nothing to grip, right? Holding on to a piece of ice would be like that. You can't grip it, right? So that's why I use tungsten and I'd use a tiny tungsten, you know, a little 16th ounce or a little 8th ounce tungsten. They're real small. This one, you look at this thing, and this is a tiny little tungsten, right? But that's like a 316. So that's the difference. When you look at an eighth, it's really small. So you take an eighth ounce, put that little hook on there, put it on 15 pound, whatever, you know, fluorocarbon. You fire it out there with that little cut R, and here you go. Just a little like this. You don't even have to fish. And all of a sudden, boom, they dump it. It's just what will happen. You just reel it, and it's doing this. A regular bait, you know, of those regular stick baits, the Ocho and the Senkos and all those, when you throw them, they're going to wobble as they sink down. All right? They just do a little shimmy. And it hits the bottom, you pick them up, they do this. And then they shimmy down, right? That's all they do. Shimmy down. That one, when you pull it, it's going because of the tail. Tail makes the whole bait do that. When it falls, it goes down. So it's never quitting. It never quits moving. And you can do just the swim with it. So now it's doing this, and it's just killed her. So the whole bait, the whole concept behind it, everything behind that, cut our worm is that, that that's now one of my favorite baits ever i just love it as soon as i saw it, that they made it i went dude that's really smart i mean that's really a, a good combination put a little rage kicker behind the, the the typical ocho style bait and you're set so that's one of my best baits in florida and in anywhere just throw it in the springtime you can dead stick it throw it out there just let it fall you know you can reel it and they just boom, hit it like a spinner bait all you want to do then is is you know drop your rod a little bit and hammer them and uh, and you're good to go and i usually fish that and this is really embarrassing but if you look at this rod and reel this rod and reel and this rod and reel without knocking them over i'm going to set them all side by side <clears throat> you see the diameter see everything they're pretty much the same rod and reel these two are exactly the same okay and when I say exactly, these are both the Quantum's uh, XO's 767. What does that mean? That's a flip stick. Seven foot, six inches long, seven power, heavy action. That's a flip stick. So there's my heavy punching rod with the big, you know, ounce and a half tungsten on there. And, uh, and I got my Rage Bug, which is uh, one of the best little baits in Florida ever. So I've got this package for flipping. Well, here's my swim jig, right? So here I got a little quarter ounce swim jig. This is the one I caught like 30 pounds down at Okeechobee on, right? Um, in the BASS a couple years ago that we had at Okeechobee. Little itty bitty jig. What do I do? I'm throwing it on my flip stick. And why? Because if you felt this flip stick, you'd see how light the whole package is. Nowadays, this rod and reel, like this, believe it or not, is a flip stick that I have on my lipless bait. And you go, why would you use a flip stick on a lipless bait? Well, this is the Exo Tour. A little different rod, but if you look at it, it's got a tip. So I've got a tip on this one. These, I don't have a tip. These are just beasts. These are to rip them and stick them. This thing has a tip on it, so when I set the hook, you know, it's going to flex. I can handle them. The 30-pound sack, and Bobby talked about it at Seminole last year, three-quarter ounce red eye, this rod and reel, ripping it. You know, you throw it out there, let it fall to the bottom, and then you go, and they, they just dump it. It is just awesome. And they kept getting bigger and I quit, which was really sad. I had, when I got 30 pounds, I'm going, that's a pretty good sack, you know, 29, whatever. And I, and I just quit. And I just finished catching my biggest one. It's like every time you're getting a bigger fish. So you catch like a five, and then you catch like a six, and then you catch like a six and a half, and you catch like a seven. And I'm like, man, I got a big sack now, and I'm, I'm done. And I'm really excited. And, and I said, I better quit because I need them. I this first day. I need them the next three days. Well, I didn't even catch a fish there the next day. That's how bad it was. So, um, but this, this rod and reel is so light, it's like the old rod and reels I used to use that were five and a half, six feet long because they were all made out of fiberglass, heavy stuff. And yet it's very, very sensitive. It's an incredible, incredible package. So they got the 
you know, the tour magnesium rod from the reel that's really light, and you've got the rod that's really light, and the whole sensitivity factor is incredible. I basically use about four different actions of rods. That's all, and, 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 and I do everything with it. It's like a set of golf clubs. You know, you can't do everything with a flip stick. So I can't do everything on a golf course with a driver. You know, you might be able to get a good drive, but boy, you get in a sand trap, you're going to be working a long time trying to get it out with a driver, right? So you got to have clubs. You got to have those those mid-range clubs, and you got to have a putter when you get to the get to the green. So you know, I, I use the seven six seven, and then I have a seven two, which is one of these again that has the lighter tip, the seven two, and this is a that's a great rod for my frog. You know, throwing a sexy and it's got to be hot in the summer and fall. That's wrong. It's a top water bait. Okay, that's what it is. It's a top water bait. You can fish it in open water with nothing around, just like you would a top water bait. There's no difference. It walks the dog, right? You twitch it real light, so you just and it does this, right? And you can twitch it hard, and you can get it to pop, 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 and you can bop the, the uh, have it slap the surface. So now it's like a little buzz bait. You can pop, 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 pop. And you know, you can hit it really hard, get it skip out of the water like a shad jumping away from it. It's a top water bait. That's the biggest thing I learned about when I went out to California, because California is where all those things really got to get finesseful and people really learned about using them out there. And um, so you get out there and you realize, oh no, they're throwing it in clear water, rocky banks, you know, sometimes it's a bluff, they'll throw it up on the bluff and, and here they go. And they get it six feet off the bank and an 18 pounder eats it, you know, that's California. But anyway, the point being, it's a top water bait. Top water fishing, I fish it on a 7.2, 50 pound. If I'm just top water fishing, if I'm fishing it in the slop, so I'm throwing it back in junk like Gunnersville, or you get some of that real nasty green stuff that grows up in the summertime, you know, that blue green algae, <clears throat> then I'll, I might throw it on a flip stick, but generally I throw it on 65 then because I don't ever want to break off. But in normal fishing, 50 pounds good. And it's so thin diameter. 50 pounds uh, braid, like Smackdown, is about the size of 17 you know, pound line, so it's really tiny. So that, that's a great combination. So I use a 7 6, I use 7 2s. I've got a couple 705s. In my 705, so see, it's 7 powers extra heavy, 6 powers of medium heavy, <coughs> excuse me, 5 power is like medium, okay? So you got a five power, 705 is seven foot, zero inches long, five power. I got a few of those, and those are for jerk baits, you know, when you're jerking, because they got light tip, jerk baits, little square bills, stuff like that. So you're seeing there's three rod actions. I got the big one, I got a medium kind of, the seven two, and then I got the little stuff. And then I keep two small rods, and I thought it was really interesting to listen to Bobby, because he says, I use short rods on top water. And I do. I keep two designated topwater rods. I don't call it my frog rod. You know, my frog rod on, on a, is a 7.2. But the two designated topwater rods are actually 6 foot 10 inches. And they're medium action. And they're just short. Because now I can twitch. And that's everything from these little, these little deals, which are the KBD splash, you know, little poppers, all the way to the, the baits that... Uh, you know, that have spinners on them, tail spinners, front spinners, here's a good thing. Anybody throw it a, a, like a devil's horse or anything like that? In Florida, that's one of the best topwater baits. I mean, absolutely, a spinner bait, any with spinners on the front or reel, uh, front or rear, uh, topwater bait, one of the best you can have. Now, here's the problem. You have a topwater bait with that front spinner. You twitch it, and what happens? A lot of times your line will catch the front spinner. Now I've had a, my partner. I took some. Uh, we took some handicap guys, and uh, he hooked a giant. I mean, six and a half, seven pounder. He's got it all bowed up, and I had forgotten. I was using one of those big round uh, nippetits, and um, hard to find them. But when you find them, they're they're good bait. And this was a gold one, my prized one. But I usually unscrew the eye, take the front blade off, because it doesn't make any difference. You take the front blade, toss it, and then you don't have to worry about it. Well, it got hung around the front blade. And he's fighting this bigger than it broke him off. And I was just all distraught. I wasn't distraught that he lost the seven pounder. I was distraught that I lost my bait, okay? Because they're hard to get there. But then he lost his seven pounder. I was sad for him too. But the but the bait was really my loss. Man, I love that bait. But anyway, so um so anyway, um what you can do, here's your tip for your top water baits if you use a front top water. 
and I throw them on, on braid. And why do I throw them on braid? Braid, no slip, no stretch, make super long cast, and, and braid floats. It'll lay up on the surface, right? Um, monofilament kind of floats, it, okay, so it floats good. Fluorocarbon sinks. So if you use in fluorocarbon, you throw it out there in fluorocarbon, all of a sudden it sinks, it's dragging your bait down. So a lot of times it'll dip under and do stuff, so I don't like throwing any of it on fluorocarbon. But here's your tip. You got braid, so I got my little short topwater rods with braid, and I usually have, you know, 40 pound or 50 pound braid on them, and uh, all that smack down. And then I tie a leader about that long of monofilament, just a short leader of 20 or 25, stiff, okay? And the reason I do that is now I tie that onto the front. You got braid, you can make super long cast, you got good, good solid, you know, 20, 25 right there, and it stays straight out in front of the bait. It never lets that line come back and get caught on the prop. So you work it all day, and you'll never have a tangle on that front blade. And I went, that's pretty cool. So I started doing that about four or five years ago, and it's been magnificent for me. So if you see me ever with a, a prop bait, it's going to have a short section of mono that's tied on. So it's real simple to do and I can show you some knots you know when we're done. I'm a big knot head anyway. I love knots because that's the most important part of your tackle. You've got unbelievable rods now you know and unbelievable reels and and hooks are amazing and and the fishing line now is so so exceptional and the weakest link you have is that little itty bitty connection between your line and your lure. If you tie a good knot you'll be golden. You know, you'll catch the fish. Uh, so many times back in the old days, I'd tie what's called an improved clinch knot. It's a knot my dad taught me. Now, an improved clinch knot's pretty simple. You know, you got the eye of the bait, you run your line through the eye of the bait, wrap around five times, come back through by the eye of the bait, that's a clinch knot. And then coming back through where you ran it down, that's an improved clinch knot, cinch it down. It's a knot my dad taught me. My dad was an excellent angler, very good, taught me a lot about fishing, but he knew nothing about knots. That's the knot I guarantee his dad taught him, and his dad's dad taught him, and that's the way it was. That's the knot you tied. That's a simple knot, right? Improved clinch knot. And, uh, but it is a terrible knot. My son, when he was a little spud, decided to do a, a science project for science, and he didn't want to do it on fishing knots. Imagine that. Dad being a fisherman, he decided to do it. So we started testing knots. And he tested and tested and tested. He'd tie every one of them, you know, 10, 15 times, and test when they would break, you know, what pound test they would break. And so he found out that on the improved clutch knot, about 30, 40% of the time, it could just come untied when, you're, when you've got it cinched down and you're pulling, right, and you're testing it to break strength, sometimes it just come untied. Just come untied. And you're like, how'd that happen? Well, how many times have we caught it? We use that knot. How many, we've all used that knot, right? And starting, you knot, you're a smart lady right there, so you don't. Not, but most of us have, and I remember my younger years having that, and I'd set the hook, have a big one on up there in Noonan's Lake, and he'd get off and I'd reel it in, I'd have a curly cue at the end of my line. Came untied, even though it, you know, and then when it breaks, it breaks at about 60% knot strength at best. That's at best. So let's say you have 10 pound, you might be getting five and a half to six pound test at the, at the knot. That's pretty poor, right? So, I mean, you want something that holds up. So we started tying what's called a Palomar knot. Tremendous knot for monofilament. Great. If you're fishing monofilament, that's as good a knot as you can get, as, as a Palomar knot. You can look at that up online. You can, you know, tie them, do whatever. They're great, okay? But if you're going and you want to fish fluorocarbon, that Palomar knot isn't any good. It's a terrible knot. And a lot of people use it on braid too. And it works because braid is so strong, you don't have to worry about it. But so here's the deal. If I'm tying on like this swim jig, and I want to knot, and this is fluorocarbon, that's going to last and work. And I just noticed I didn't bring any cutters. So, well, I got a knife. So I'll rest this up here and hopefully it'll stay. I don't know if it'll stay right there or not. But anyway, I do have a knife so I can do this. So, and I'll show this to you, kind of walk, walk it through you, or walk you through it. I don't want to cut myself, which I definitely can do. Okay, so here's what I do <clears throat> for fluorocarbon. Fold it over, almost every knot will be double to make a good knot. Okay, so double it, 
slide it through the eye of the hook. Now this is real simple. I take that line, go into my rod, I lay it in my left hand, through my little finger, over all my fingers, and lay it over my index finger. Okay, I draw a circle. There's my end. So all you see is I drew a circle with my index finger in the middle. I take this end, three times, four times, you're done. That's it, right, one, two, three, you can go four, and then you just put it right back in where your finger was. Okay, so what you're gonna do with doing that is I let go of this end, and what you're gonna have is you have, this is the loop, the lines go in the loop, wrap around and come out of the loop on the same side of the loop, and you just pull it up, all right? Do you have to wet it, moisten it? Sure, you can if you want. You don't have to. And you've got that loop in, because remember you doubled it over to make it a double line, and you trim that. So you got three tag ends. If you're in a lot of slop, like here in Florida, let me show you a cool little trick. And you can do this with any knot that you tie. Look at this, here's my end. First thing I do is I go around my main line and back down. Cinch that gently, take the double, go around my main line, back down, right? Which is, what that is, is a half hitch, right? And I cinch them, and now what does that do? Puts my tag ends down rather than up. So now, when you're coming through that mucky stuff and the grass and the blades of grass, instead of hanging up and getting all the gunk on the front, their tag ends are down. You just trim them off, you're ready to go. That is called a double pitson. Okay, it's a pitson knot. You can look that up online. It's extremely strong and it's so simple. You can tie it single, that's good, but double is better. Okay, so you double line just three times around, back through, cinch it down. It's a great, great knot. So that's what I use on fluorocarbon. Tested it, it works good. There's one other knot. Remember I told you about the improved clinch knot? If you double your line and tie an improved clinch knot, that's a tremendous knot and it works well on fluorocarbon. So a double improved clinch knot works good on fluorocarbon. The Pitson knot works great on fluorocarbon. They're both very good fluorocarbon knots. Okay. The only thing about the double improved clinch knot is it's a big knot, you know, and it takes a little bit more to tie it, where that one's so simple, just right through it. I can tie that one kind of by braille, which is good, because I'm I'm always having to look for these things. I don't know how many guys have gotten to the age where they got to have the little readers, yeah. So anyway, that's me. So I can tie that one without doing it because why? It's simple. You're just going around three times or four and just go right back to the top where your finger is. So everything fits. You don't even have to see it. Cinch it down, you're good to go. So that's, that's say, a lie that everybody out there, the vast college man.